I watched the trailer for Alex O'Connor's debate with Ben Shapiro on the motion, Is Religion Good for Society? and was reminded of just how cringy debates about religion and atheism can be. This isn't meant as a personal attack against him, or Ben, or anyone else. I'm not going to go full Peter Hitchens on Alex. No, I actively dislike you. But rather against what I see as a vacuous discourse surrounding the debate between religion and atheism. In the trailer, Ben makes the point that modern institutions which provide us social support once existed within traditional religious structures. To which Alex rejoins that it's amazing how quickly ostensible de deontologists transform before our very eyes into utilitarians on this question. This response is, to be curt, incredibly lame. Ben clearly doesn't believe in Judaism because it has some real world utility, but rather because he believes it to be a cogent account of what reality is, and I would assume he would still believe as such should his religion provide no real world utility. However, Alex takes a bit of a cheap shot, as if Ben's religious belief was grounded in utilitarian concerns, all in the name of point scoring. It takes me back to the cringy gotcha days of the new atheists, where the deep and meaningful meditations on religion and spirituality were replaced with a superficial point scoring contest to see who could stump their fellow interlocutor. Many of these debates with the new atheists and those who moulded themselves in their image, such as Lawrence Krauss, Ayan Herseli, and to some extent Alex, was just a self-masturbatory game of intellectual tennis to see if they could pitch a question their opponent simply couldn't return, as if moral grandstanding and discombobulating your opponent was some halfway towards meaningful spiritual insight. I say this as someone who was a great admirer of the New Atheists, and of Christopher Hitchens in particular, so I understand the temptation to mirror their style and to mould oneself to the words of God is not great, the end of faith, and the God delusion. No doubt the Atheists had their place, beginning in 2004 with Sam Harris's book The End of Faith, followed by Daniel Dennett's and Richard Dawkins' books, Breaking the Spell and the God Delusion in 2006, bookended by Christopher Hitchens' work God Is Not Great in 2007. Their works emerged in an atmosphere of political and civic strife when the Danish cartoonist Kurt Westergaard drew a picture of the Prophet Muhammad, leading to protests across the Muslim world and debates around Islamophobia and the freedom of speech. As many of you will remember, Charlie Hebdo Weekly reprinted these cartoons leading to 12 people at the publication being killed in 2015, with many others having to live under police and protection. Similarly, Salman Rushdie, since the release of the Satanic Verses, has lived under the constant threat of religiously motivated attacks for lambasting religious belief. However, much of the atheist discourse has failed to evolve from the mid-2000s. It's kind of like that kid who failed to grow out of their emo or punk phase, they're still wearing spacer earrings and a green mohawk in their fairies. Theists in the West have largely failed to move past the gotcha pop philosophy of the new atheists. The sort of thing you might see in a Ricky Gervais comedy. How can you not believe in God? Which one? What do you mean? I think one possible reason for the superficiality of the new atheists, and for those that followed in their footsteps, was that none of them were serious philosophers, bar Daniel Dennett. Christopher Hitchens was a journalist, Richard Dawkins an evolutionary biologist, and Sam Harris a neuroscientist with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. So while they would leverage their expertise to make interesting and compelling arguments, they were often at a loss to offer deeper, naturalistic accounts of the existence of an object of morality, or even more gravely, an existential account of how individuals and societies should orient themselves in the absence of God and religion. Admittedly, Sam Harris in his book The Moral Landscape did try to provide an objective, scientifically robust account of morality. However, much of this philosophy was based on a scientifically underpinned utilitarianism, where good moral actions were the ones that led to certain brain states associated with pleasure and other positive characteristics. But he still couldn't explain why the fact that certain brain states are associated with psychological pleasure or fulfilment would be necessarily and objectively moral. In other words, what makes pleasure objectively ethical just because we think it is a good thing? 
What if the same brain states occurred when we murdered and raped others? However, it would seem harsh to overly criticise the new atheists for failing to ground secular ethics in an objective moral framework. This is really the domain of moral realism and there is certainly no shortage of debate to be had there. With that being said, I remain sympathetic to many of the positions taken up by the new atheists. I would still describe myself as a hard determinist of some type. I still appreciate Dennett's mimetic account of consciousness, and Hitchens is always an engaging polemicist, even if he had made some weird claims about John Mersheimer's work being smelly. However, not much more can be said about Sam Harris, the man who wrote a book titled Lying, and argued that we can radically improve society by telling the truth in situations where others resort to deceit, who suddenly found himself saying that he might have been willing to engage in a propaganda campaign to deny the democratic election of Donald Trump in 2016. Not that honest then. That's a, just a conspiracy, that's a left-wing conspiracy to deny the presidency to Donald Trump. Absolutely it was, absolutely, right? But I think it was warranted. We've all stood on both sides of the divide between what someone believes and what he intends others to understand. And the gap generally looks quite different depending on whether one is the liar or the dupe. The liar often imagines that he does no harm so long as his lies go undetected. But the one lied to rarely shares this view. The moment we consider our dishonesty from the perspective of those we lied to, we recognize that we would feel betrayed if the roles were reversed. Never. I have three main contentions with the new atheists. One, the futility of debating the existence of God in the West. Two, imputing the sins of ideology to religion. Three, the delusion that individuals can dismantle religion and orient their lives around scientific inquiry and that such a life would be more meaningful. It's very touching for Tony to say that he recently went to a meeting that bridged a religious divide in Northern Ireland. Well, where does the religious divide come from? The new atheists were great at illuminating the stupidity of staunchly devout theists, which, while entertaining, represents a shriveling number of people in the West. Religious belief has nosedived, with only 49% of Britain saying they believe in God, falling from 75% in 1981 and 41% and 26% believe in heaven and hell respectively. And I imagine that these statistics are inflated by the uptake in ethnic minorities migrating to Britain who tend to be more religious and socially conservative. Similarly, only 50% of Americans believe in God as described in the Bible, the lowest figure in American history. The trajectory of religious belief is only going in one direction. To argue about the existence of God wasn't exactly novel in the 2000s, but now it is achingly trite. I still regard myself as an atheist, but it's the kind of debate smart teenagers have until maybe their early 20s, and then they realise that there are more interesting and exigent topics to study. The point of the new atheists was to bring about a secular world of non-believers, then either by their hand or by cresting the waves of historical change, we are now marching inexorably towards such a world. We in the West are bathing in the afterglow of a post-religious world, and the prospect of economic and cultural globalisation will ensure a wave of secularisation far beyond the West's borders. But how dare you suggest to us that we couldn't teach our children self-restraint and respect for others in the Golden Rule? How dare you! Many of the debates followed a line of inquiry where some religious zealot questions how atheists can derive their ethics from a cold, desolate, Darwinian world, to which the atheist in question would posit that ethics derived from humanism or Darwinian evolution, only to then turn their pitchforks to the iniquities of religion and make a category error by regarding the evils of the world as the unique export of religion. As the great physicist Steven Weinberg has very aptly put it, in the ordinary moral universe, the good will do the best they can, the worst will do the worst they can, but if you want to make good people do wicked things, you'll need religion. <laughs> now, you don't need religion, you need ideology. The greatest evils are waged when people are prepared to cross a river of blood for their own ideals. Hitchens gestures towards this point by calling North Korea the most religious country he has ever visited. North Korea is not a religious country, nor is China, 
and nor was the Soviet Union. Rather, these countries were gripped by ideological zeal as authoritarian governments exercised hard and soft power for the use of state propaganda, killing tens of millions and enslaving the minds of many more. The new atheists saw religion as a force multiplier of the world's evils, which it no doubt has been at various points in the past, but that is the result of an unwavering commitment to an ideology itself, religious or not. Ideological fanaticism is all around us. The war in Ukraine is not a war of religion, but a clash between two different geopolitical ideologies, as Ukraine, led by the US like an old horse on its way to be put down in the woods, has attempted to pivot towards the democratic, liberal hegemony of the West, and away from Russia, a profoundly suspicious autocratic state, still marred by the chaos of the 90s, resulting in rivers of blood washing over eastern Ukraine and global food shortages devastating the poor and wretched the world over. We can see many examples of the worst excesses of ideology as it becomes fanatical and violent by simply looking at the rise of the incel movement, the manosphere, the extreme right with the storming of the Capitol building, and the extreme left with groups like Antifa and the anarchic riots waged under the banner of BLM. Religion was not a primary or secondary or even tertiary cause of these misfortunes. It was ideology. If you want good people to do bad things, first, give them a set of ideological beliefs. Second, make them believe that these ideals are just and ought to be brought into a morally righteous world. And finally, make them believe that violence is a legitimate and effective means of bringing about this just world. Ideology is the root of all evil. I felt the presence of the Lord. I have had that personal experience uh, in a way that whatever you say with fancy Darwin talk, I have felt it the way I felt this chair. Yeah. How do you respond uh, to that? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not impressed by that because there are a similar number of people who are Hindu, brought up Hindus and say, I felt the presence of Lord Krishna and etc. I mean, there, there, are, there are all sorts of illusions that the human brain is very capable of, of creating. And, That's um, an illusion. Those people, are uh, yeah. those people deluded, those people that say they have had a religious experience? I think they are, yes. Those people who say that we have experienced a miracle, that yeah. God has well, interceded in the world. So. Yes, most definitely. That, that's a delusion. Yes. Perhaps the most unsatisfying lesson from the new atheists was the idea that we could enjoy fulfilling lives guided by science, reason, and unadulterated hedonism. No doubt the new atheists appreciated to one degree or another the timeless wisdom of religion and spirituality. Sam Harris wrote a book on that very theme, titled Waking Up, and Daniel Dennett held a talk on how institutions of the future should parlay the strengths of organised religion. However, the new atheists, like many of the Enlightenment philosophers of the 18th and 19th centuries, guillotined God and prophesied a golden age of reason, seeing the pursuit of truth and beauty as a sort of balm to serve man's existential anxiety. Dawkins attempted to resolve the riddle of finding meaning in our lives in his 2012 documentary series, Sex, Death and the Meaning of Life, recounting the spiritual journey of three different intellectual figures, Leo Tolstoy, Graham Greene and Albert Camus. After exploring Tolstoy's devotion to his faith, Greene's game of Russian roulette and Camus' absurdism, Dawkins offered his own account and remarked, so I think meaning is subjective, something personal we may not all agree on, but that shouldn't be an invitation to egotism or self-absorption. Dawkins asserts the standard existentialist charge, that meaning is subjective and we each have to find our own meaning in the world, which, while true, doesn't quite chime with the scientific quest for truth and reason, as Dawkins endorses during the documentary. I agree with you that, yeah. that one doesn't want to devote one's life to accumulating exactly. material, exactly. sort of hedonistic yeah. happiness. Um, I'm not sure that I would look inward, though. I think I, would, I might get happiness from music and from science. Exactly. And, when you do something that is creative, something that really satisfies your inner urge. You know? Yes, but meditating and sort of looking inwards exactly. doesn't, doesn't sound to me as though that's really doing that, perhaps it, it Of helps. course.
Indeed, under this view, meaning can be found by directing our attention out towards the world in a scientific quest for what is real. We cannot be blinded by religion, as Dawkins goes on to add. Science does the opposite of making things banal. It's about unleashing curiosity and uncovering more mysteries to solve. We take so much for granted, we become anaesthetized by our familiarity with what's around us. Science shakes off the anaesthetic and we look again with new and clearer eyes. We can only awaken from our religion-induced slumber by the bright light of scientific inquiry. We can see Dawkins playing loose and fast with the concept of truth, which he drives home in his final soliloquy at the end of the documentary. Just look how far we've come in my lifetime. We've got life-saving medicine, supercomputers, the internet. We can travel further and faster, higher and deeper than ever before. We constantly push at the frontiers of possibility. Imagine what's still to come. We are made by the laws of physics, working through four billion years of evolution. We have a brief window of life through which to see the universe and understand how we came to be in it. The truth may not always be comforting in the face of suffering, but it has a majesty of its own. That's what I tell people when they ask me, why do you bother to get up in the mornings? Dawkins once more refrains that the search for truth is an ample source of meaning, even if it is uncomfortable, it no less has a majesty all its own. By this point, it is clear that Dawkins is conflating a scientific notion of truth with an existential one. A life in pursuit of empirical truths is no doubt a form of truth within the parameters of the scientific method, but in a universe with no objective meaning, it is no more existentially true than dedicating one's life to the great juju at the bottom of the sea. If we take as our starting point the nihilistic view that there is no objective meaning to life and that all possible lives are equally meaningless, then the new atheists, by attempting to dismantle religion, have simply exchanged one collective mythology for another while making the mistake of thinking that science brings us any closer to objective meaning. Instead, the new atheists' mythology that life can be lived more meaningfully through the pursuit of truth, science and reason, illuminates the intersubjective construction of collective mythologies. Living a meaningful life is kind of like a game of football. We all know on some level that the game of football is just a bunch of made up rules that puts the player in engaging and exciting scenarios as they try to outperform their opponent. But we all know that kicking a ball over a line doesn't mean anything objectively, and even seems absurd under close inspection. However, it's just something that happens to resonate with us, and we buy into it. However, we nonetheless buy into the collective mythology of football, of its history, its rules, its strategies for winning. We develop a great appreciation for displays of skill, and the aesthetic beauty of the game played at a high level. We know it is a myth, but it is not a myth to us when we are engaged in it. It is not a myth for the player who scores a last minute winner. That is the challenge of the human condition. To live as if there is no human condition. To live as if there is objective meaning, even in its absence. To fabricate a myth without realising that it is a myth, whether it be a myth of religion or science. Which might explain why the more you look for meaning, the harder it is to find. It is a balance of knowing and not knowing. Dawkins remarks that meaning is subjective. But as it relates to individual lives and its scale across cultures, I would argue that meaning is intersubjective and dependent on the construction of shared myths, whether it be the mythology of religion or science, or that the family is of great value, or that career progression is what matters. These are all existentially meaningless pursuits, but they deeply resonate with our intuitions, purpose and structure and allow people to play the game of life and to be fully immersed in it, even if it is all meaningless at a cosmic scale. Having guillotined God, the new atheists dismantled one of the few myths to provide intersubjective meaning at scale, a myth that coordinated people to work together and pursue common goals under shared ideals. The new atheists were adroit in their attempts to dismantle organised religion, 
but lacked the wisdom to see what religion told us about the human condition. Humanity's greatest capacity is not our intelligence or our self-awareness, but is rather the capacity to tell ourselves and others persuasive stories that are as a matter of cosmic reality entirely fallacious. It is the construction of shared mythologies that weaves people together, that solidifies national identities and binds ideological groups together. Asking what is the meaning of life is a category mistake. It is to ask what is the weight of a triangle or the diameter of human greed. However, no doubt we as a civilization will put religion to rest and construct a new collective mythology that we think truly and really matters. Maybe politics has already taken religion's place. We tell ourselves, like the football player, that the next election really matters, the next battle really matters, the next goal really matters, and our role within this collective struggle is worth living and dying for. And in the process, it comes to satisfy our individual need for meaning, purpose, and order in the world. It makes us feel as if we have some sort of agency over how events transpire. It is all just a game, a story we tell ourselves to soothe the soul. This is something that, at least tacitly, great philosophers like Plato and Albert Camus understood. That to furnish lives with a sense of meaning was to engage in a collective mythology that people take to be truly important in some cosmic sense. Plato's myth of the metals portrays each human as having a precious metal inside them. Those naturally suited to be rulers have gold, those suited to be guardian silver, and those suited for farming and other crafts have bronze, thus giving everyone a place and a purpose in wider society. For Camus, the myth of Sisyphus portrays a man condemned by his king to an eternal life of pushing a boulder up a hill, only for it to roll back to the bottom and beckon our hero to give it a try once more. It might be pointless, but we have to imagine Sisyphus happy. In other words, that Sisyphus has managed to narrow down his focus to a task he knew to be absurd, but became so invested in that for a moment all other concerns melted away. What the new atheists failed to realise is that in a world after religion, Western civilization is in a desperate need for a new age collective mythology. To breathe life into the corpse of new atheism, atheists will need to understand that we are not living in the antebellum south. The forces of religious orthodoxy are in retreat and secular liberalism has planted its flag in the west. The war is over. Like many revolutionaries, the biggest obstacle is figuring out what to do the day after victory. Where does the movement go from here? Or will the new atheists of our day wheel out religious crackpots to excoriate and show trials in front of braying audiences? If we are going to find fulfilment in a post-religion world, we need to have our eyes fully open to the dangers of ideology and its tendency to encourage our lesser angels, or we would risk committing many of the atrocities of our religious forebearers. Moreover, we have seen in the vacuum left behind by religion that has been rapidly filled by rampant consumerism, polarising politics and the atomization of society, leaving behind broken people reaching out for support with no one to turn to. Having banished religion, what now will bind people together in a common set of concerns and ideals? What now will provide a life-sustaining source of meaning and encourage people to look out not only for their own well-being, but for the well-being of others. What collective belief structure will encourage an individual to tend towards the needs of their fellow creatures?